Hello, welcome to High Rock at Home. We invite you to celebrate with us the love of God, which is all around. I'm going to sing this.
center. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, the sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy and love. Oh, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, oh, About four years ago, a woman named Sheila Donegan from the Boston Dream Center invited me and some other pastors to uh, uh, go to the Suffolk County Jail, downtown Boston, uh, at 8 Nashua Street, to do a, a Bible study called Soul Care. And for about three years, I had a privilege of going in to a secure unit with about 50 or 60 men. We could circulate about, invite them to a smaller classroom to do a Bible study. And over that time, I got to know about 60 men and to hear their stories. And uh, it made me begin to think a lot about the whole nature of incarceration. Why is it that we have so many people incarcerated? Why do we have 2.3 million people incarcerated in the United States? Why is a fifth of the prison population in the world in the United States? Why are there 44,000 obstacles for people, men and women, getting out of jail that perpetuate the cycle of incarceration? So as a result of that, a number of us, a handful of us, have wanted to address and, and, and to create a, a broader coalition of, of churches that want to address this. And we want to do four things. We want to help men and women who are presently incarcerated. We want to help those who are getting out. We want to help their families. And we want to address the policies that, uh, that perpetuate incarceration. Um, what God has been showing me through, through all this is it's been a very breaking experience. The men that I've met are, number one, they're image bearers of God. Uh, they're, they're, they're men that God has created. Secondly, they all have a story. Uh, there's always a backdrop, and not to excuse the uh, activity that has led to their incarceration, but every man that I ever met has a story that usually involves either severe trauma, abuse, or some sort of uh, issue that has perpetuated their incarceration. Uh, third, I also learned that every man needs hope. 
uh, every uh, one night, I, I'll never forget when I asked, there were about 10 men in our small classroom. I said, what do you guys need? And without hesitation, a man named Scott said, hope. And I imagine, what is it like if for us to be devoid of hope? We, we have relative security, we have housing, employment, our families are relatively secure perhaps. But imagine if every avenue of hope was stripped from you, and when you got out, you had absolutely no sense of, of what you were going to do about your future. Imagine having your future stripped of hope. The, the last thing I learned is that God commands us to do something about it. Jesus said he's going to have a little conversation with us in Matthew 25 about what are we going to do about food, water, clothing, shelter, disease, and incarceration. And it's up to us, it's up to the church to mobilize and to care for this population. We have to be the solution. One of the things that gives me hope is that I believe the church on a wider scale can, can address the topic of incarceration. We can help people who are presently in. We can help people who are transitioning out. We can help their families. And we can help address the policy issues that perpetuate incarceration. And what I love about High Rock Church is uh, last fall I was part of a Rethinking Incarceration study group. And it was a wonderful experience to meet other people who want to serve this population. And, and they were relaunching another study group this, this winter, meeting on Wednesday nights. And the other thing is that a handful of us have launched a micro church meeting on on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. And we have a group, some are professionals who are actively serving this population, and other, others of us have, are simply have been affected by it personally, as we have either family members or uh, have been deeply touched by this. And when we come together, sometimes we laugh and smile, but every week so far we've come to tears because it's, it's, our hearts are so broken as we think about uh, the, the men and women that we care for. So what gives me hope is that, that we as a church, we as a body, we truly can to serve this and we can help reduce the cycle of incarceration. Um, one of the things I've been doing over the last uh, several months is corresponding with uh, two of the men that I've met, in particular a man named Adam that I met uh, uh, about a year and a half ago and we had a chance to get to know one over several months before COVID and he's now incarcerated in a state penitentiary. And I write to him every few weeks and he writes me back and this is his latest letter. I would also like to thank you for reminding me of God's love and protection as well as God's way of carrying us through the hard times. One of my favorite passages is 2 Corinthians 12, 7 and 10, when Paul was given a thorn in the flesh. I like to remember this passage specifically during hard and very stressful times because when I do, I'm reminded that I am able to get through my tribulations with the power and grace of the Almighty Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what gives me hope that men like Adam can know the Lord and that he can be a vessel for Christ while he's in and after he gets out. That's what gives me hope. Let us pray now, asking God to illuminate the truth we encounter in scriptures. Almighty God, you have given us every spiritual blessing in Christ. As we turn our attention to your holy word, remind us of this generosity and guide us to become participants in your ongoing work in the world. To the glory of your holy name, amen. Today's reading from the word of God comes from the gospel of John chapter 14, verses one through 14. Pull it up on your Bible app, open up your Bible, or follow along on the screen as I read. That is John 14, 1 through 14. Hear the word of the Lord. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
If you already know me, you already know my father as well. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after having been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? Don't you believe that I'm in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority. Rather, it's the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whomever believes in me will be doing works that I've been doing and they will be doing greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hi, I'm John, one of the High Rock pastors. While that Bible reading is still fresh in our minds, I want to point out something, that these are words of encouragement. Jesus starts off by saying, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then he says he will be leaving them to prepare a place with plenty of room for them all. This word of encouragement was deeply needed, not only because Jesus was speaking of his imminent execution, but also because he had just finished telling them about an impending betrayal. Jesus' right-hand man, Peter, the one who had just pledged his life to Jesus, would abandon them right when they needed him most. And just before dropping that bomb, Jesus revealed that one of the 12 disciples would be the one to betray him to his executioners. It sounds like they have a lot of reason to be worried, maybe even panicked. But Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust God, trust me. I have to leave, but we will be together again. You know the way. You know the way. What an incredible word of comfort and assurance right when they needed it most. Except it's not. The disciple Thomas pretty much speaks for them all when he responds, what do you mean you know the way? We don't even know where you're going. How can we know the way? You can almost hear the exasperation in Thomas' voice. Jesus and the disciples are operating in two completely different realities. They have two different truths and two very different understandings based on those alternative facts. What do you do when you have completely different understandings of the facts at hand? The disciples look at the facts and see plenty of reason to be deeply alarmed, but Jesus looks at the facts and says, don't be troubled. Trust God and trust me it's obvious that they are operating from two different realities. I remember being in a discussion with a good friend about which foods you should eat and which ones you shouldn't. Each of us could cite different sources and studies and then other studies that debunked those studies. You know, what about veganism? What about the paleo diet? Or maybe it's not the foods you eat, but how you eat them. What about calorie restriction or intermittent fasting? Finally, my friend said, you know, it's really hard to know anything. And on that, we both agreed. It's hard to know anything. Think about any viewpoint that people might hold. Whatever view it is, some corner of the internet has a whole community of people who have a whole set of alternative facts and plausible sounding arguments about why their viewpoint is actually the truth that everyone else is suppressing. It's like when Kyrie Irving of the Boston Celtics seemed to believe that the earth is flat Later on, he said in an interview that he just loved hearing the debate and that he was doing research on both sides. The NBA commissioner who, like Kyrie, graduated from Duke said, we must have taken different classes. Eventually, Kyrie recanted, apologized to all the science teachers and laughed about it a little saying, you know, at the time I was huge into conspiracy theories and everybody's been there. And before we laugh with or at Kyrie, let's be honest, there are a lot of flat earth arguments that many of us would not know how to answer. For instance, why is it possible to sometimes see an object that should be blocked from view by the curvature of the earth? 
How can we see it unless the Earth really is flat? Explain that one, you round earthers. Like my friend said, it's hard to really know anything. Now, there are solid answers to all those questions that, about supposedly flat Earth or other conspiracies, but debates over facts are moving away from the fringes into the mainstream. In the past four years, and especially in the, the last few weeks even, I have heard numerous journalists and scholars lament that we are a nation divided into separate Americas. We used to share the same facts while debating over the meaning of those shared facts. But now we can't even agree on the facts themselves. Each reality has their own websites, their own news networks, their own trusted leaders. And of course, many black Americans have believed that there were two Americas long before the past four years. Martin Luther King Jr. famously spoke about two Americas in many of his speeches, addressing the divides of social class and race. And when it comes to race, there really have been two different stories, two different sets of facts, two different truths. Many of us on staff, along with a number of High Rock lay leaders, are in the middle of a nine-week course on black history, a course offered through a ministry called the Nehemiah Project. And in my group, every week, someone, sometimes everyone, shares how they learned something about America that they had never learned before. Two different sets of facts, two different Americas. When what we thought we knew keeps blowing up, how are we supposed to ever know the truth? Again, like my friend said, it's really hard to know anything. And if we can't be confident in what we think we know, and if we can't find common ground with others about basic truth and reality, then where do we go from here? In the wake of the mad violence of the First World War, the poet William Butler Yeats wrote a poem called The Second Coming, a poem that many see as almost prophetic about our current situation. In the first stanza, he says, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. And at the end of the first stanza, he says, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. That poem is a hundred years old, but it reads like it was written yesterday. So what is the way forward? And into our mess and into the mess of our Bible passage today, Jesus says, you know the way. And Thomas says, no, we don't know the way. We have no idea what you're talking about. To which Jesus responds, what do you mean you don't know the way? I am the way. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We're going to want to unpack what Jesus is saying here. What does he mean that he is the way or that he is the truth or how can a person be the truth? But before we do that, we want to give you a chance to start discussion with whomever is with you where you're watching or else in the comments section on Facebook. Welcome back. I hope you had a good discussion, and if you'd like to continue that discussion, I invite you to consider joining us in the Zoom meeting we have after service each Sunday, and it's called Continue the Conversation. If you can't find the link, just ask for it in the comments. So what does Jesus mean that he is the way, the truth, and the life? Well, the very next thing that Jesus says gives us the answer, and for someone, it's a comforting answer, but for others, They are some of the most disturbing words that Jesus ever uttered. Listen to what he says. I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. 
That reply has confronted and haunted people for 2,000 years. Jesus is the way to what? Well, to the Father, to God. And Jesus was clear about this earlier when he said that he was going to his Father's house to prepare rooms for them all. Jesus is going to go first, but he'll come back to lead the way. This is the way. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. Actually, it's not this is the way, but more Jesus is the way. The way is not a path as much as it is a person. Following where Jesus leads, that is the way. And saying that he is the life, what does that mean? I believe it means that Jesus not only leads them to God the Father, but that Jesus himself is God the Son. Jesus is not only the way, he is the destination. Later in his great high priestly prayer, Jesus will pray these words. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is to know God, to be in true, deep, abiding, loving relationship with God. Eternal life is not just a length of life, it is even more a quality of life, to know and be known by the creator and lover of our souls. To know God the Father is life, but Jesus is also life himself because the Father is in him and he is in the Father. Well, despite what Jesus says, Philip wants more. He wants this life that he knows is in God the Father, so he says to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. But Jesus answers, anyone who has seen me has already seen the Father. Jesus adds that he is in the Father and the Father is in him, and this shouldn't be news to the disciples. Earlier, the crowds wanted to stone Jesus for blasphemy when he said, I and the Father are one. So Jesus is the way, and he is the life, that deep abiding connection to God. But I think it's this middle claim that gives people the most trouble. The way and the life are bookends around the truth. What does it mean that Jesus is the truth? Perhaps nothing Jesus has ever said offended more people than this short statement. I mean, others might say, sure, Jesus is a way, but the way? And sure, Jesus might lead some to find life, but to, can he claim to be the life, the only way to find rich connection with, with God? And then to claim that Jesus is the truth? How can Jesus make such a radical, exclusivist claim? And how can his followers take one of Jesus' most controversial statements and make it a central article of faith. Don't all paths lead to God? Isn't every religion just a different path up the same mountain? I remember when one church in the Chicago area decided to answer this question in an interesting way. They gathered local religious leaders of different faiths, and in front of an audience of several thousand, these leaders of different faiths were asked to give their answers to some of life's most basic questions. I believe they had a, a Muslim cleric, a Jewish rabbi, a Hindu priest, a Buddhist priest, and a Catholic priest. I know it sounds like the setup for a complicated, but, a complicated joke, but no, it's not. They were asked questions like, what happens after death? How does a person find salvation? How does a person seek forgiveness? Are all sins forgivable? What is the physical world and what is its purpose? And on and on. Many in the audience, and even many of the leaders themselves, started out with the assumption that their answers would be substantially similar. But as the questions progressed, you could see the expressions on their faces change, and eventually one of them finally blurted out, it seems we really do believe different things. It's not just different paths up the same mountain. It appears that they are different mountains. Jesus doesn't just claim to be a way or a truth. He boldly claims to be the truth. Having said that, Jesus' followers have often attempted to spread that truth in ways that were definitely not the way of Jesus. And perhaps that's in part due to the fact that we misunderstand what Jesus meant when he said that he is the truth. After all, what is the truth? In Greek, the word for truth, aletheia, is very similar to our word truth in English. It means reality or what is real. Something that is true is actual and not imagined. But in the Hebrew mind, the word for truth is slightly different. 
In the first half of the Gospel of John, we called our series, Grace and Truth, How Jesus Changes Everything. And in that phrase, grace and truth, it comes from the opening of the Gospel itself, where it says that, the grace, that, says that grace and truth come through Jesus. That phrase, grace and truth, occurs only this one time in the entire New Testament. But this pairing of grace and truth actually occurs many times in the Old Testament. However, in Hebrew, grace and truth have slightly different connotations, so it's translated differently in English, and you might not notice. But probably the clearest example of this pairing is in Psalm 85, where it says, Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness, grace and truth, meet together, righteousness and peace kiss each other. The Greek translation of that passage in Jesus' day would have had the same words for grace and truth that John's Gospel uses. It's the exact same phrase. Grace and truth is love and faithfulness. To the Hebrew mind, the primary definition of truth is faithfulness. We have seen this same definition of truth in English, but for us it's a secondary definition. You know, like the Beach Boys sang, be true to your school. Or, you know, be true and faithful to your partner. Be true to your word. Uh, true to your principles. Being true means to be faithful. This secondary definition in English was the primary definition for the Hebrew mind. So when Jesus says, I am the truth, he is probably not saying, I am ultimate reality, as much as he is saying, I am the full manifestation of God's faithfulness. I am the fulfillment of all of God's promises. I am the proof that God is true to his word. Jesus is the living truth that God is faithful to all the promises made. Through Jesus, God is faithful to the promise to cast our sins as far as the east is from the west, the promise to take our scarlet sins and make them white as snow, to bless all nations through the seed of Abraham, to redeem the world and rescue us from the power of Satan and death. When we see that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of God's promises, it is easy to see how he must also be the way and the life and how no one will find their way to God but through Christ. None of us are true enough, that is, faithful enough, to save ourselves. It is only because God is faithful, faith, faithful in and through Christ, that we and this whole world can be saved. But what difference does this difference in definitions make? You know, what difference does it make to say that Jesus is reality versus saying that Jesus is the incarnation of God's faithfulness? If we think about truth mostly as reality and facts, then arguments, conflicts, and power struggles are almost inevitable. If you don't believe me, find someone on the opposite side of the political spectrum from you and get into an argument about whose viewpoint is more true. And historically, that's all too, half, all, all too often what happens when Christians, what Christians have done in the past. We have literally crusaded to force the truth upon unconvinced people. I mentioned that for the first half of the Gospel of John, we called the series Grace and Truth. But for this second half, we're calling the series lost, where the church went wrong. And I believe that this idea of truth is one way that the church has often gone terribly wrong. If truth is simple facts and reality, then maybe arguing and fighting is the way. But if truth is faithfulness, if truth is something that is lived in committed relationship more than just a belief or a set of doctrines, then arguing and fighting is almost never going to be the way. Jesus didn't seem to spend nearly as much time arguing about the truth as he did just living out the truth. And if he is the way, then the answer seems obvious. But just in case it's not obvious, let's break it down. If truth is faithfulness, then we must not only know the truth, we must live it out faithfully. It's one thing to know that we should trust in God and trust in Jesus, like Jesus says here. It's also important that we know that Jesus means, um, that knowing Jesus means we know God. Elsewhere in the New Testament, we are told, however, that even the demons believe in the fact that there is a God. So knowing the truth as a set of facts may be important, but it is never enough. 
More important than just knowing the facts, we are called to live faithfully in response. The truth has to move from our heads into our hearts, into our hands and feet in how we live. We are therefore called not to just speak the truth, but to be faithful. Faithful to God, faithful to one another, faithful to walk in the way of Jesus. In a world full of fake news and alternative facts, we must follow the one who is truth and be true ourselves. Speaking truth is certainly important, but we must move beyond words to live and love faithfully. When I was in high school, my friend Rob was faithful to God. Uh, It's easy for a teenager to fear rejection and embarrassment, but still, he had the courage to invite me and several other of our non-Christian friends, I wasn't a believer then, you know, to this overnight youth group event at his church. And it was terrible. I mean, some of it was fun, but at 2 a.m. They, they showed us Christian scare movies about the rapture and how believers would be suddenly taken up into heaven while non-believers would be left behind, or movies about dying and heading to what looked like an airline counter only to discover that you had no reservation. And in the morning, instead of serving us pancakes like we were promised, they made us spaghetti instead. Apparently someone forgot to do the shopping and Rob never lived that one down. But he was faithful even when it was costly. Later in college, when I was struggling to pay for school, one day a check showed up in the mail, a check from Rob for $500. That's around $1,300 in today's money. And he refused to let me pay him back. He was faithful even in a literally costly way. And later, when I started to get involved in his family's church, his mom became like a foster mom to me. She led the church choir and I played the keyboard for the choir. And Mrs. Stites was there for me and helped me process all that pain that I couldn't discuss with my family because it was about my family. And years later, when I was almost ready to quit my marriage, Rob was there to talk with me and and listen and encourage and pray. He was faithful. They believed the truth. But even more importantly, they lived the truth. They lived faithfully. When it comes to mere facts, like my friend said, it's hard to know the truth. But when it comes to being true, to living faithfully, that is much easier to see. It's costly to do, but it's easy to see. And that's how Jesus is the truth. He is faithful and he is the proof of God's faithfulness, the fulfillment of all of God's promises and in such costly ways. Jesus shows how and why the church got it wrong, how lost we have often been. But Jesus also shows us how to get it right. And if we believe in Jesus, if we believe that he is the way, and the truth, and the life, then something amazing will happen. Jesus promised, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. Now people have often made a big deal about this promise. After all, if Jesus is God, then how can we do even greater things than him? But realize that in the flesh, Jesus reached 12 people, and by extension, 120 who were waiting in the upper room for the gift of God's Spirit. But even 120 is a small number. High Rock is not a big church, but even we are several times 120. Jesus in the flesh could reach several dozens of people, but Jesus with us in the Spirit, with all of us around the world as his body, we can reach not dozens, but millions. But greater things doesn't always mean bigger things. Instead, the greatness of Jesus was in changing 12 who would then change the world. And he did it by laying down his life. And maybe that's the ultimate call to being true. To be true to the people whom God calls you to love for the sake of God's kingdom. Not just your family. Even mobsters love their families but to love beyond the bond of blood relation, to love as family those for whom Christ bled and died, making the blood bond of family beyond our natural relations. Like Rob and his family loved me, 
like my family is trying to do with the people in our lives, like many of you are doing through your work or through your serving or giving or fostering or adopting and in so many other ways. And all of us together in Arlington and Cambridge and Lexington and Quincy and Metro West, through High Rock Online and beyond, to not only seek the truth, not just know the truth, but to live the truth, to be truth, that is, to be faithful in the ways that Jesus was faithful and is faithful even now. As we close, I invite you to consider how Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life for you and for all of us together. And how might God be inviting you to live faithfully, to love faithfully, to live the truth with your friends, your family, your, your co-workers, and your neighbors? This is the way. Amen. In just a few moments, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper. If you forgot to grab a bit of bread or wine or juice or whatever you have on hand to take part in this time, go grab it and you'll be all ready for the words of institution. In coming to the cross, we are invited into solidarity with suffering. We do long to celebrate Easter, but take this time to practice waiting and reflecting and sitting with that longing. As you take communion today, let God receive your own laments of how long, O oh Lord. In taking communion, we are reminded that the living Christ is present and embodied with us as we wait. May this be a reminder of the presence of hope in the waiting. All who wish to receive the love and grace of Jesus and put their trust in him are welcome. Hear these words of the Apostle Paul. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and gave thanks and broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Take it and eat. Following the meal, he took the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Take it and drink. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Sisters and brothers, family, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and give thanks. If you are alone, take the bread for yourself. If you are with others, offer it to each person with you, speaking their name, and say, this is the body of Christ given for you. Then when everyone has received the bread, we invite you to pass around the cup and say, this is the blood of Christ poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Once everyone has received the bread and dipped the bread in the cup, we invite you to take and eat together. If you have children in the room or anyone else who is not participating in this way this morning, we invite you to speak this blessing over them that will be on the screen. Pastor John asked some great questions in his message this week. The one that resonated most with me is, how is God inviting you to live faithfully, to love faithfully with your friends, your family, coworkers, or neighbors? John also mentioned that the challenge to be faithful can be outside the bond of blood, outside your family. Like Craig's, Craig's life story, that is well outside his family how he and others are living faithfully in the ways that they are caring for the people who are incarcerated. And they are advocating for reform of institutional policies that are disproportionately jailing people of color. Living and loving faithfully, being true. By the way, if you wanna know more about what Craig and his friends are doing, there's a lot of information about that at High Rock Online on our website, We'd love for you to check it out. Maybe that is exactly what God is calling you to do today. Me, I'm wondering what it means to live faithfully, to be true in my neighborhood. How do I live in a way right here in Arlington, where I live, that reveals the love of God, God's love that he has for all of my neighbors? I'm looking forward to those opportunities and to the interactions that will be in store. 
Friends, my hope is that you are wrestling with these questions, with this message today, and that you are inspired by the Holy Spirit to do even greater things in your home, your neighborhood, town, our country, and throughout the world. Now hear this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. for
Thank you. 